In this last podcast on Post-Impressionism, we're going to take a critical look at the work of Vincent van Gogh. His paintings were virtually ignored during his lifetime, but they command iconic status today. As for van Gogh, he's become the poster boy for the mad genius. Let's see what I can do to put the art and the artist into perspective. If you recognize those lyrics, then you have probably heard the popular 1971 song, Starry Starry Night. I wonder what Vincent van Gogh would say if he knew that he was the subject of music and film. That his works would sell for millions of dollars and hang in museums all over the world, including one dedicated to him in Amsterdam. What would he think about reproductions of Starry Night on everything from umbrellas to coffee mugs to tote bags to flip-flops? For an artist who sold only a single painting during his life, would he be overwhelmed by the score of scholarly articles and books analyzing his work? And that's just the art historians. Physicians and psychiatrists are still weighing in on Van Gogh's mental health. Even astronomers have published on the veracity and rationale for this painting's content. Are we talking about the man or his work? Can they be separated? Should they be? I want to start by putting Van Gogh's work into the context of post-impressionism and the 19th century art world. His subjects are typically modern. He painted still life, everything from shoes to flowers in a vase. Landscapes of wherever he was living, including his house in Orles and St. Paul's where he was hospitalized. He had favorite landscape elements, in particular wheat fields, olive and cypress trees, and he was interested in the depiction of skies. Again, this is not unusual. No one accused Cezanne of obsessive behavior because of the concentration on fruit, or the years that he took before he decided a painting was finished. Monet routinely painted the same subject, and he produced over 200 works of water lilies alone. And then there were all those ballerinas by Degas. Like the Impressionists, Van Gogh also painted interiors, restaurants he patronized, his room in Arles, even pictures of his hospital stays. He painted all the time. He painted a few genre scenes, some portraits, as well as self-portraits. He was often sort of cash, so he rarely hired models, but he wanted to improve his work on figures. Generally, he asked friends or family to pose. This painting is the town postman. His cheapest figure model was always himself, which may be one reason for the number of self-portraits. Stylistically and theoretically, he was in line with other post-impressionists. He exaggerated formal characteristics to better convey his ideas about the subject, everything from line to color to perspective. He often wrote about his process and his choices. Again, that's a very 19th century habit. It was an era of letter writing. He was very excited about his painting, The Night Cafe, and he wrote about it while he was still working on it. He used strong dark outlines, bright, highly saturated colors, and a skewed perspective to convey his ideas about cafes and bars and the people who frequented them. Yellow was a favorite at this time. It was one of the new colors on the market and he was anxious to experiment with them. He was intrigued by the way color could convey emotion and ideas, and he often wrote about this to his brother Theo and his sister Wilhelmine. In fact, his letters are continually filled with descriptions of what he saw around him and how he wanted to paint that. He described everything in terms of color, making it very clear that he saw color as a visual vocabulary. Style was as important to him as it was to Cezanne and Seurat and Gauguin. He was very familiar with their approaches, but not interested in duplicating them. Like Gauguin, Van Gogh had very little formal training. Much of what he learned about painting, he learned on his own, working from prints that he owned. These are early paintings, and you might not have recognized them as his work because they are very different stylistically. Van Gogh learned by doing, by experimenting. He made a series of paintings based on Millet's The Sower. 
changing the angle of the figure and the tree with different color combinations and perspective ranges and painting techniques. By 1888, after exploring a variety of avant-garde painting techniques, Van Gogh settled on a style that is characterized by what I would call a signature brushstroke. Regardless of color, and his works range from intensely hued to pastel, it was his brushwork that distinguished his work from that of other post-impressionists. Let's use this version of the sewer to work through those ideas. The subject is mundane, a farmer walking through the field at sunset. The interpretation of a sower had a long European history, however, with biblical references, and a 19th century viewer would know those associations of regeneration, hope, nature, and a trust in God. Van Gogh built on that, but as he wrote to Theo, he wanted to paint a masterpiece that would be a symbolic language in color alone. The painting is divided into discrete areas that are identified by color and form. A low horizon literally divides the scene into two sections. The top dominated by that new and intense yellow, the bottom overlaid with thick blue strokes of paint. A jutting triangular clearing in the lower field directs the eye back to a vertical stand of wheat over which floats a blazing setting sun that sits squarely in the middle of the canvas with rays so pronounced that they obliterate the sky and transform it into a mass of pulsing yellow and gold. On the far side, small patches of that same blue suggest a farmhouse and a distant village. Much like a classical Italian landscape, those tiny blue patches act as in framing devices, but in a very post-impressionist way, and with a nod towards Cezanne, that blue connects the top and bottom registers of the painting. Counteracting the vertical and horizontal sectioning of the painting, Van Gogh positioned the sower as a diagonal figure, arms swinging and striding through the field. Painted in the same colors, with the same heavy, purposeful brush strokes, the sower is structurally, aesthetically, visually, and philosophically united with nature. Van Gogh's brush strokes have been the topic of a lot of discussion. They have been described as anxious, tense, exuberant, and angry although I prefer to describe them as obvious, regular, conscious, and rhythmic, with the ability to convey a range of meaning that can also include the lyrical and tranquil, much like these landscapes do, a sensation that is heightened by the emphasis on curving lines and color. Heavily loaded with paint, the brush strokes bring a materiality and texture to the surface of the canvas. They convey shape, form, depth, weight, and movement, but also emotion and a sensitivity to the subject. As an artist friend of mine commented years ago, the man knew how to move paint. Scholars and critics frequently describe his paintings as having a pulsing sensation, and that is the sense of movement that he achieved. That's harder to see in a slide, but impossible to miss looking at the actual work, because then you can see the texture, the ridges, the sensuous physicality of the paint. This is another of his many wheat field paintings, and the side details should help you understand how we used color and brush strokes to build up the layers of paint, swirling different complementary and contrasting colors to create forms and shapes. The structure and direction of the brush strokes move the eye both through and across the canvas. Details are eliminated. They really don't matter anymore because the painting recreates the subject as Van Gogh conceptualized it and intended the viewer to experience it. Once established, Van Gogh adapted his signature brushstroke and approach to color to whatever subject he painted, from one of his self-portraits to sunflowers or irises. Consequently, there is remarkable stylistic cohesion to his work from the last four years, and that is when he was the most prolific. His interest in using color to convey emotion remained a key feature, and his technical expertise developed dramatically.
in part because he painted constantly and was his own ruthless critic in his efforts to be successful. He was familiar with both the aesthetic issues of late 19th century avant-garde art as well as the practical considerations. How to establish a reputation, make contacts, get work shown, attract criticism. His family had business ties to the buying and selling of art. He had spent time working in the London branch, and his brother Theo was an art dealer who kept Van Gogh in touch with the current landscape of the Paris art market. What was showing and selling, what buyers were looking for, what the critics were saying. All of this was important for an artist trying to establish a reputation. For Van Gogh, his choice of subject was always a springboard to more complex ideas and connotations about nature, permanence, life, and art, and how he could communicate those ideas through color. If he liked a subject, he painted it over and over again. He thought it would be worthwhile to paint night skies, which is an intriguing idea given the avant-garde focus on light and plein air painting, which generally steered artists towards daytime scenes. Van Gogh's very deliberate choice of technique with its abstracting tendencies, his commitment to color as an emotional and artistic vocabulary, and his shift from paintings that described and documented to those that were conceptual in nature, that challenged audiences to think about what he was doing with paint. This is at the crux of post-impressionism and a defining characteristic of modern art. Changes like these reinforce the association of modern art with technical radicalism and abstraction. They shifted the critique from the narrative to the formalist and repositioned the artist and his subjectivity as crucial to the work. Any critical evaluation of modern art is based on its aesthetics and creativity, the direction that it establishes for the avant-garde, the questions that it raises, and the issues that it addresses. In the case of Van Gogh, those considerations were initially overshadowed with speculation on his physical and mental health, his sexual traffic with prostitutes, a disastrous friendship with Paul Gauguin, the ear-cutting incident, and his sudden death in 1890, possibly an intentional suicide. Van Gogh went from relative obscurity during his lifetime to being a posthumous celebrity. His widowed sister-in-law was instrumental in this. She promoted his work, helped get exhibitions and critical attention which secured their place in the modern canon, along with their sale and investment value. Prices for Van Gogh's paintings have never declined. Scholarly critique circulates through journal articles, university press publications, and conference papers, and that means a small, somewhat elitist audience. The 20th century public perception of Van Gogh was dramatically shaped by popular culture. In 1934, Irving Stone published Lust for Life as a biographical novel, and the book became a critical success and a multi-million dollar seller. Stone based his book on Vincent van Gogh's letters and his own interpretation of the artist's life and work despite no art historical training. The popularity of the novel expanded into the 1956 film featuring Kirk Douglas, whose physical similarity to the artist reinforced a storyline that depicted van Gogh as a tortured genius, a madman, whose ravings and drunkenness resulted in one remarkable painting after another. Alternating between emotional rages, drunken sprees, and feverish painting sessions, the film closed with the artist putting the finishing touches on one of his Wheatfield paintings, and fades to crows circling in the sky and the crack of a gunshot, leaving audiences to believe that Van Gogh spent the day painting plain air, finished wheat fields as a virtual trumpet call to his impending death, and then promptly shot himself. That makes for dramatic entertainment, but plays fast and loose with historical accuracy and hardly does justice to his talent, his technique, or the gravity with which he approached his work despite years without critical acclaim. Had he been a scientist working on a new theory, we would describe that single-mindedness and dedication as intellectual determination rather than paranoid behavior. 
Nevertheless, the popular perception persists of Van Gogh as a troubled suicidal artist and his works as a direct projection of mental instability. Postmodern theories and methodologies have since generated different questions and priorities about art and art makers. And many art historians have written about Van Gogh's work and art more critically in an effort to debunk the various myths and to focus on the work in its historical context. The medical community has weighed in as well. There is no agreement today on a diagnosis, but more consensus around bipolarism or acute intermittent porphyria, both of which are now managed with medication. Associating creativity and individuality in artistic expression with madness, violence, and repressed sexual energy creates a false paradigm of what constitutes the artist and marginalizes anyone who does not fit the stereotype, and that includes women and non-Western artists, people working in different kinds of mediums and practices, or with different goals for their work. From the existing letters and historical documentation, there is little doubt that Van Gogh struggled with physical and emotional issues, with disappointments and setbacks, both personally and professionally. It is also clear, however, that like other avant-garde painters, he valued creativity and experimentation, intellectual and subjective expression, and he understood the effort and dedication that was necessary to achieve excellence.